Um, thanks, Toby. So, so yeah, you, you were going to get a double act uh, from Gary and me, but I, I think I was infected in the bars of Newcastle last night. <laughs> so so um, I've got to save my voice for tomorrow when a, a session for uh, Toby tomorrow. But I guess I just wanted to come at it from a slightly different angle from um, a charity voluntary sector viewpoint. That a lot of these conversations that I've been involved in over the years have placed the emphasis on local authorities having to change and you having to change your commissioning structures to get it right. I can tell you that there are as many, if not bigger, challenges for the voluntary community sector and charities if you're going to adopt this way of working. And certainly what we've learned over the years is that if we acknowledge that the system is broken, which we probably would do, what we have to acknowledge is that many charities have developed their own systems and processes around a system that we know is saying broken. So if that's broken, it probably means that we as charities and service delivery agencies need to kind of rethink the way that we do things. And that's very difficult. You know, I've learned over the last couple of years, when you walk into a board of trustees and you say, you know we've been doing X, Y and Z for the last 25 years. I'm now kind of thinking we should stop doing that. That often comes as a bit of a shock for people. But actually, if you are going to work differently, and I don't want to be too controversial, if you want to work differently, I think we all need a very honest conversation with ourselves because the reality is there are probably too many of us doing the same thing. And that sounds controversial, but if you Google something like the amount of homeless agencies that work with rough sleepers and you calculate the amount of staff working in the system, there are probably more staff supporting rough sleepers in the system than there are rough sleepers in the system which is just, to me, kind of madness. So, so, so anyway, um, if anybody wants to know any more from it, from a, a kind of third sector point of view, grab me at the break or afterwards, but I just wanted to kind of make that point before I hand over to uh, my colleague, Mr. Wallace. Thank you, Gary. Thanks. Um, clearly, John's a bit of a lightweight. But, um, so, um, uh, so I'm, I'm doing a bit of the macro stuff. I was here a couple of years ago. Um, <coughs> And I've done quite a lot of that around the country. And people repeatedly said, can you tell us a bit of the detail? So there is, I am focusing on some of the detail in this. Uh, the other thing to say is our learning is remarkably similar to the learning from Mark's work in Gateshead. We find exactly the same things. We have slightly different starting points, but um, everywhere I know in the country that's doing this work finds the same, finds the same thing. And lastly, I'm not here to tell you that we, we're great and we've solved this, because we certainly haven't. This is an active program. Um, so I'm talking specifically about um, complex needs today, but there are virtually, I don't know, half a dozen, maybe 10 different kind of work areas in the council that adopt a similar approach. Plymouth is, is an integrated commissioning uh, agency. So the CCG, the pub public health and the council have legally pooled all of our money into a single budget. Uh, we only have four strategies, and we all, we're all co-located on one floor of one building, and we're all mixed up together, so we don't have separate work areas. Um, yeah, it's part of the kind of integration process. And this is really the very high-level stuff, which has unlocked the opportunities for, for staff, really, in every part of the council and the CCG to take a complexity-informed uh, approach. So I think when we merged, I think they found they had, I don't know, 160 strategies or something. Um, and so now we have four. So everything that we, public health, the CCG and the council does, comes under one of four strategies, which just makes everything simple. So the case for change for us around complex needs, now we're using the making every adult matter definition of complex needs. So that's homelessness, offending, uh, addiction and substance misuse. Substance misuse. Oh, the, the other, yeah, they're, they're actually there. <laughs> so, so the whole process started with a failed lottery bid, um, but as part of that process, we did an enormous co-production over three or four months, um, and essentially we we refresh that every couple of years. So we do mass co-productions every couple of years for a number of reasons. One, because if, you, if people tell you something, it's only polite to go back and tell them what you did about it. Um, but it also gives us legitimacy. Uh, um, you know, we are able to say, well, you know, when people say, well, that consultation's a bit stale, well, we do it every two years, so it's never stale. And it's also about trying to get a representative view rather than individual people that use services. 
But the broad feedback we got as commissioners was this, that we're actually we were seen as a largely top-down, opaque, disempowering master servant process which we carried out in silos with no reference to other silos. Uh, we commissioned really short term, we didn't look kind of long term, we didn't look at systems and it, effectively commissioning was acting as a problem setter rather than a, rather than a problem solver. And services um, got similar <coughs> feedback, so even services that saw themselves as really, really focused and engaged with the people that use them were told in no uncertain terms, you do things to us, you don't really do things with us. We also found these really significant mismatches between what workers value about their work, which tends to be around specialism, because that's what we in commissioning have valued, as the intervention point that Mark makes, the idea that we need people who can cure things. What the people that use services value, um, authenticity, warmth, persistence, is essentially support, uh, which is what Mark's uh, already detailed. And the other thing is we, we all assume that all services, you know, they all kind of knew each other, they were all borrowing sugar from each other and having cups of tea together. What we fi found is actually they were, they were in staggeringly ignorant of, of what each other, even services physically located next door to each other, knew almost nothing of what the other service did. They had lots of myths about each other, but um, very little kind of detailed understanding. Our challenges are the same as all challenges uh, for local authorities. We've got no money. Uh, we've, we've got a very small commissioning workforce. It's, it's kind of diminished quite a lot since 2010, not to make a political point. Um, the dominance of new, of new public management approaches, you know, everyone that's successful, including you know, people like me, got successful under new public management. Uh, and it's quite difficult to go to your chief exec and to say, well, that thing that you're really good at that got you this job actually is a bit rubbish. We want to change it. It's quite a hard thing to do. Um, but the, the reality is we've all been working this. You know, we all kind of uh, were, were doing this unknowingly for quite a long time before we discovered what we were doing. Um, the context and practice of legal and procurement over a number of years o over uh, under previous uh, chief executives had been uh, quite different to the to the context we wanted going forward. That is not to blame legal and procurement, but just to recognise that the context had been different. The context had been quite um, the default position. Quite often was no, you can't do that, and that's because that's what had been rewarded by the by the previous chief executives, that we, we encountered resistance from services because quite a lot of services have been very successful at this and they're quite reluctant to change and John, had he still got his voice, would have told you about some of that. There's quite a lot of perceived risk because you're asking to do something radically different and, and the person that ultimately is, will find themselves in court, they kind of, they, they, they quite like some landmarks they're familiar with in order to take those risks and they're often not there. Um, so it takes quite a lot of bravery. And the other thing is, historically, commissioners worked to quite short time scales. You know, you're, you've got a contract end coming up, and you've got to do something fairly quickly. And what we were arguing for was quite a long period of time to, uh, to go through and, and, and be different. The things that enabled us to, to, to be different and continue to enable us to be different, uh, initially with the support of two directors, Director of Public Health and Director of the Integrated Commissioning Team, that what they essentially created was a safe experimental space for us. They bought us uh, about nine months of facilitation by the Leadership Centre, who were really kind of excellent for us. Um, the, the directors were willing to adjust in real time to our emerging learning. That's really, really important because you start with an idea, oh, it's going to be like this, and then suddenly you have to go back six months later and say, that thing I said, it's completely wrong and we need to do something else. Um, and they were kind of really willing to, 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 to do that. Uh, they also gave us a project which was large enough to prove a point, but not so large that if it, if it broke, it was going to kill the, kill the authority. So, so it's a, it was about an £8 million a year uh, project. Um, and they allowed the people, those of us that were actually doing the work, mastery autonomy on purpose. So we were allowed to, to, get, to get on and do it. So the long and detailed version. So these, these are the actual steps that we, the actual things we did. Please come in. Um, uh, so I, I'm not going to read them all out because there are a lot of them, but it's just really to give you a sense of the kind of things you, uh, you have to do. Some of them happen simultaneously. It's not all kind of chronological. Um, but our starting question, 
uh, that was quite an open question. So in an ideal world and within resources available, what would the system for people with complex needs look like from the perspective of system users and how would we know? Now, when we talk about people uh, mm -hmm. in, the com in the system, we, we mean everybody. We don't just mean the people that use the system. We mean the people that commission it, uh, uh, the people that govern it, and the people that work in it, because collectively that's what the system is. Um, so the really kind of broad brush thing is, so we had a series of workshops um, where we were providing lenses for looking at things and, and specific things we, we could use, but, but essentially time together. It's really important that you have lots of time together. So in this project, there were 29 services and five commissioners. Um, so that's quite a lot of people to get to know. Uh, we did quite a lot of feed, uh, field work, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. We had learning labs. So, so essentially at that time, the learning labs were really opportunities for us to come together with the leadership centre and get a bit of coaching, feedback, uh, and, and kind of reflection, collective reflection. The mass co-production we keep doing keeps giving you representative feedback, which tells you when you're on track and when you're off track and maintains your kind of currency legitimacy. And essentially what we're trying to do constantly is to build empathy, insight and understanding for everybody in the system, all the workers, the commissioners and the people that use it. So the steps kind of, you could broadly, we broadly divided it into an exploration phase, that's finding out what, it, what is the system and, 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 and that's not just about identifying the services in it, but the processes within the system. How does it work? How do you get from from service over here to a service there. How do you get a prescription? How do you stop a prescription? How do you, you know, whatever it, whatever it is. Um, so the first stage for us we, um, was sharing why we are where we are. So we kind of, in reflection, uh, we, we described that as a phase of truth and reconciliation. So, so for us as commissioners, we there was a lot of kind of pent up resentment about, <laughs> about things we'd done in the past. And, um, and we, we kind of needed to sit down with, with, with services and understand how they felt about that and take that on the chin. And similarly, uh, they needed to do that with the people that use their service because they also got uh, a kind of truth and reconciliation phase. Uh, so there, then we kind of got into an introduction to system lead, leadership. So the council funded everybody in the system to do the systems leadership work. So all the 29 services and five commissioners did it together. And you go through fairly obvious things. You, you, what do you want to add to the system? What, what is it that you think is wrong and, and, and what do you want to do? So you need to have a kind of working, a working idea about where you're heading, even though you know as the work progresses, you're, you're not going to end up there. That you're going to be led somebody somewhere else. So the things that are really important are this, is this idea of creating an empathy map, so you're building understanding of a life in a complex system. So, so workers, they're, very, they're really service-based. They're, they're not system-based at all. They don't, and they see the person in front of them for an hour a fortnight or an hour a week. They don't really understand what that person's experience of a whole system is. So if you think about a typical person that uses a, complex, uses a drug agency, they are occasionally in prison, they are occasionally homeless, they probably have a mental health problem and a mental health worker, and they may have a, you know, something going on around benefits or debt or, or something else. But, but very often the worker has no understanding of that. So it's about trying to find ways to understand what it's like for people that use services. So that leads you to this collectively agreeing the lines of inquiry you're going to follow to try and understand, uh, to try and build this empathy map of what it's like for people in the system. And then you go through a fairly standard thing about planning field work. Now, the aim of our field work was twofold. Firstly, it was to find stuff out. And secondly, it was to build relationships between the people doing the inquiry. So very often in a system, people don't know each other. So they have no trust because they don't know each other. Uh, but in pairing people up, or sometimes in threes, going off to do some appreciative inquiry or to do a workshop or to run a focus group, um, they learn stuff together, they explore stuff together, so they get to know each other. Um, and this idea of witnessing is quite important late in the process when you want services to stop doing stuff. So quite often, services love to start doing things. They're less, 
they're less keen on stopping. So, you know, if John and I went to see Mark and Mark told us John does this thing in his service which makes his life worse, and then a year later I want John to stop doing that, and John doesn't want to, I can remind him that he and I witnessed Mark telling us that thing he does makes his life worse. And it becomes very difficult for John to continue to do that thing which is dodgy. Um, <laughs> sorry, he's definitely dodgy. Um, I so say you, you get all this field work back, you, you kind of bring it back in the, in, in the big group. Uh, and then what we did was try to uh, say so you can kind of construct an archetype or a character, uh, if you like, for, for, what, you know, for substance misuse or for mental health or whatever. And then it's a kind of a thought experiment where you're trying to say, well, what would the cast be if you were trying to, to meet this person's needs? What would the cast look like? You know, who would be involved? How many services? Uh, how could you kind of square that, square that circle? And then you go through a process of reframing your inquiry questions. The way you do that is, is by reframing your inquiry questions. So you start with very broad, and we're going to do this a bit later. Um, so the way we do appreciative inquiry is uh, we, whatever someone tells us, we put in the first person. Uh, because that, that, is, that gives you their perspective uh, in a way, if you keep it in the third person, it doesn't. And we kind of, we share all those stories. I'm not going to say too much about that because we're going to do it a bit later. And then you refine the questions. So the way we did it is we had really broad questions to start with, bring them back, share them, uh, discuss them, uh, and then reframe a slightly more specific set of questions and then bring them back and reframe them in a slightly... So, so you, until you feel you've actually bottomed out the, the nature of the problem. But we also did things about horizon scanning because, because we, also, we, we also need to follow the science. We don't want to do things that we know are ineffective. Um, so it's also about trying to identify from the environment other things which we can bring to bear which we're not currently using uh, which would work alongside the individual experience. So it's not just about just listening to people. It, it, it is also about applying what we know is effective in, in various kind of conditions. And then you kind of move into a development phase. The way we did that was to develop scenarios in order to focus the design work. And they're all derived from the inquiries that we do. And as I said, we will do a bit more on that later. The other thing we were trying to do you're constantly, the two things you're constantly trying to do is you're constantly trying to build empathy between everybody, but you're also trying to create a culture of thoughtfulness. So that the other side of standardization is it's thoughtless. It happens without anybody thinking. There is a standard response, and that's what you do. And what, in our context, what we needed was for people to think about everything all the time because we're not doing standardization. Now, now that's, quite, that's very empowering for workers once they kind of get the hang of it. But, but it's quite, it's, it's a bit of a shock when you, when you start to introduce it. <clears throat> One of the things we did to encourage that is this idea of rapidly generating ideas. So the 30 ideas, the task was to generate 30 big ideas in five minutes. And that people go, yeah, it's crazy, you can't do it. It's, it's, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to avoid self-censorship. So you're trying to create a uh, sense of intellectual playfulness. When no one's going to judge you if you have a crazy idea. Although, if you, what I would say, if you're going to do dog walking for lonely people, you should probably risk assess the dogs. Um, so then you prioritize the, so you prioritize the big ideas uh, in the context of, of what you've learned so far. Uh, I'm going to show you the big ideas in a bit. Uh, and the other thing is, we did was identify the core system level principles, which sounds a bit jargonistic, but when I show you them, you'll, you'll see what I mean. And then you move into prototyping, which is what Mark's been talking about. We also use the term prototype, not pilot. So the, the history of a pilot is someone says, we need to pilot something, and then you spend nine months trying to eradicate any risk at all, and you introduce the pilot, and then the, the moment's passed, so it's way too late. So people often say, we need to be more like the voluntary sector, uh, well, this is what the voluntary sector do. They, they, they try stuff. They try it in really quick time. And so we were trying to introduce that. So some of the, just to pick out a few of those and expand, uh, expand the detail for you. 
So what's really, 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 really important is to learn from listening. So people will say, well, I listen to people all the day. I assess people every day. But the, the nature of an assessment, and I, I've been a clinician, so I know, is you have a mental checklist in your head, and you're ticking symptoms because you're, you're listening with a particular purpose, which is, to, which is to diagnose what's wrong with the person so you can fix it you, from your skill set. But actually, we were talking about a different kind of listening, a much more open uh, form of listening. And the point of that is it builds empathy, because if you listen really openly, and I've got some examples which I'll show later, it reveals the person as fully human, com a complete whole person, not just a disease or a, or a particular addiction to a particular drug or a set of mental health, systems, uh, mental health symptoms. Um, and we consistently heard that people feel rejected and ignored. And that applies to everyone in the system, to the commissioners, to the people working in the system, and to the people using the system. They all say, no one listens to me. <laughs> um, we also heard repeatedly that, that people value connection, authenticity, kindness, and warmth. Everybody, the commissioners, the people that work in the system, and the people that use the system. So when, you, when we did appreciative inquiry with staff, one of the things we frequently heard from staff is, well, so one of the things we ask is to uh, tell us about, uh, tell us about a, a case you had that went really well, is people thank them. What, what that tells you is they never get thanked. No one thanks them routinely. Uh, and that's, that's staff. So you can imagine what that's like for people that use services. And we also heard that the system is really, really confusing. No one really understands what it is and, and, and how it works. So our original, because people have asked this in the past, what were your original appreciative inquiry questions? And these are they. There were, there were four to start with. Um, uh, how can we understand what people value about being in services in order to ensure that they get those things? And that applies to commissioners, to people that work in services, and to people that use services. Because we're all, that's what makes up a system. Uh, it's not just about the people that use the system. So these, these are the original ones that we paired off and went out in very disparate pairs to go and talk to groups of people that use services, groups of staff in services. Uh, some of our big ideas, so we had 30 big, big ideas and we kind of coalesced those into six themes. It's no surprise what the themes are. They're the same for everybody. It's about how asset-based approaches. Co-produced records was quite an interesting one for us. So, so one of the mechanisms for us to move to an asset-based approach is around co-produced co records. So we did lots of work, what we call behind the door. So when people are working one-to-one, -one, we did lots of work listening to that about what, about what happens. And, and what happens is the workers probably got a caseload of 60 or 70 people. They don't really remember what you talked about last time you saw them two weeks ago. Um, so they look at the notes, and they wrote the notes, and then they say, oh, that's what we talked about last time, and they start talking using that as a jump-off point. Well, actually, when we spoke to the people uh, using the service, their understanding of what they talked about was completely different to the workers' understanding. So we had this, uh, one of our ideas was the client makes the record. So if the client makes the record, then your starting point is always what the client, so the client says at the end of the session, this is what I think we talked about, and so when the worker opens the book two weeks' time, that's where they start, where the client thought they ended. So it's about trying to rebalance, rebalance power and move towards a more asset-based approach. Integrated working, no surprise. Of course, everyone wants integrated working. What we call network working with other systems. So there's a lot of overlap between systems. Uh, so the, the obvious one for us is the acute trust, emergency department, hepatology department. Uh, and, and, and our stuff. Um, an idea of safe places. So that's not necessarily safe places. To, it might be safe places to live, but it's services need to be safe for people. Uh, psychologically safe, uh, physically safe, those kind of things. And a developed workforce. So the example I give about that is the, our direct access hostel used to say to me years ago, 80% uh, of our people have got a mental health problem. I need a CPN. What we would say now is, if 80% of your people have got a thing, it's your thing. What you're describing are deficits in your workforce. You have become so specialised, you have forgotten 
what causes your core business. Um, so, so we need to invest in your workforce. We need to reskill your workforce. So we are creating this idea of a, a knowledge and skills framework for a complex needs specialist. One of the big mistakes we made was to describe what people do from the work, kind of what's behind the door, as, as really good quality general support. You know, people do not like being called generalists. So, so we've kind of reframed that as complex needs specialists. So the reason we do rapid pro prototyping and why it's different to piloting, you come, up through you come up with better ideas through practical learning, trial and error. We all do it all the time in our kind of work, life outside of work. We just do it in work now. So uh, fail fast and learn is a real kind of mantra that we've adopted. So our practice is anyone can have a good idea. Art good ideas are not an artifact of hierarchy. And our practice, if someone says, I've got an idea, it's okay, go and do it and uh, tell us what you learn. Um, and we, John and I were talking this morning, actually. So we're both part of the Alliance leadership team. We have, there are so many experiments running, we just cannot keep on top of them. We, we don't know how many they are, but then we don't really need to because the way the system works now, it's not very hierarchical. Um, it, it, it enables really seemingly wild <laughs> ideas to be tested, and those wild ideas often turn out to be transformational uh, in ways we didn't we would never have anticipated. They would never have been agreed as a pilot because they're too risky. Uh, and the other thing is experimentation is infectious. Once you start to do it and there, you see the positive, con the, the product we're looking for is learning. Failure is important learning. It's just as important as success. And we value them. We never criticize if something doesn't work because that's important learning. And we want people to experiment. We want people to be thoughtful about what they do. So I talked about mapping system principles. So, so the obvious, so the, it's the kind of bold capitals. They're, they're the principles, leadership, commission and contract, organize, delivery, experience and design. But these are the kind of things underneath those headlines that we think about how we lead the system, how we influence wider policy, how we change the nature of value. So, so if you're a commissioner and you're used to commissioning for a set of proxy outcomes, how do, you, how do, how do I, as a commissioner, revalue what's important when I'm not using those metrics. That's a very important and difficult problem to solve. Uh, the kind of deserving, undeserving. So we have to do these things, these more bespoke, more collegiate things, even with the people that we don't like. The, the, the clients, the heart sick clients that people sometimes call them, the really difficult people, uh, you know, the uh, I'll, I'll come on to those in, in a bit. It's, it's almost especially those people because they're the people that cost us a fortune in unplanned, in unplanned care. Um, so organisation is really important to so how we organise and structure ourselves. So for farm for us, the system, we have a group called the System Optimization Group. I didn't pick the name. Um, but that, that was the initial group we formed of all the 29 services and the five commissioners where we were considering um, uh, system issues. So one of our narratives is the problem is always culture, the answer is never structure. So, so the traditional <coughs> management response when something doesn't go wrong is to say we need a restructure. But, but actually all of our learning told us that structures are largely irrelevant. What's relevant is how you change culture. And so the, we only introduced two new structures, both focused on changing culture. The high level one is the system optimization group, it's largely chief execs and commissioners. Uh, and the practice one is the creative solutions forum, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, and the, it's a feedback loop. So the creative solutions forum, which is solving really difficult cases, we identify with every case what was business as usual, we could have just done this, and what is, why was it, how was this caused by the system, and that goes to the system optimization group. And, and, and so you've got this kind of virtuous circle where your practice raises system problems, the optimization group solves the ones it can, and the ones it can't are passed up to the, the integrated commissioning team, which is, uh, as I said before, the CCG, public health, and the, and the council. Um, yep, so delivery, how are you going to deliver support? Um, how are you going to individualize that? Uh, how are you going to develop strength-based focus? These are all things that collectively we solved before we got to the point of commissioning. Um, 
language, the transform transformative power of language is incredibly important. So although it sounds fairly glib that we talk, not I or you, we talk about we, um, the, from top to bottom, the way we talk about the problem, the way we talk about each other, the way we talk about people that use the system has fundamentally changed, uh, almost to the point we find it difficult to talk to other systems in other places that haven't been on the same journey. We don't talk about, we don't use any of the language of conflict to describe the delivery of care. We don't talk about frontline staff because that conjures up an image of workers under siege battling hordes of the enemy rather than workers who want to do the best they can facilitating people trying to act services to which they are entitled. So, so we try to use our words, which are about care and duty and service and, and those kind of words, and not the language of conflict, magic bullets, frontline staff, entrenched rough sleepers, all those kind of war words. We don't use them. We, talk, we, 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 we try to use plain English to describe what we do. Uh, we don't use the language of business very much. We don't talk about the industry or markets or that stuff. We talk about what we do. Um, Okay, time. So the, very, very broadly, and very, very glibly, what shifts did we make? So essentially we moved from that list of things there, paternalism, competition, uh, dishonesty, fear and frustration, to uh, what you see on the right, really shared responsibility, some collectivism, uh, honesty. Uh, we really encourage this risk-taking thing, um, but also, shared decisions about when to stop, which is what you raised, which is a, a constant kind of uh, thing, to try and ensure services are not allowable for life. When does someone, when do you stop being an ex-offender? When does uh, someone who used to use drugs cease to be an ex-drug user? I mean, it's a, it's a valid question, because these labels exclude you from a whole range of services if you have these labels. So it's, it's really important that we think about when we stop using negative labels. So how do you commission that? So this is what we did. We used an alliance contract. So an alliance is a vehicle to share risks, a way of working which is based on alignment. Uh, it's not a legal entity. So all the components retain their organisational identity. It's not a merger. It's a bit like the EU and subsidiarity. <laughs> so a traditional contract looks like that. In fact, it would probably look like several more commissioners than that. Um, an alliance contract looks like that. So uh, it's a combination of the, of the services and commissioners working together uh, as a leadership team. You have what's called a an owning commissioner, but their role is, 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 is slightly different. And these are the Alliance principles, so it's collective responsibility, you make decisions best for the person, um, best for the system, not best for the service. It's unanimous decision making based on these principles, um, no fault, no blame, open book accounting, transparency. Uh, when there's vacancies, we, we, we review every vacancy and decide, you know, do we still need that thing which was from the old world? Uh, best, best, best person to do it does it. Uh, and at all times to act in accordance with the Alliance values. So it's a value-based way of, of working. Um, the, this is the governance. So you have a commissioner as owner. So they basically give, you, give us our mandate. Um, so so, we, so some, it's sometimes said that we don't have outcomes so we do still measure we don't still we do still measure all the same outcomes that you do for these services what we don't do is performance manage them so we treat um, the metrics as, um, as as learning points so if something goes red or green or amber we try and understand why it's moved we don't try and force it in any particular direction so, so the way we, so we do still, we do still, um, we do still measure that. We just don't perform some management. So, so that's the kind of governance structure. You have the alliance leadership team. That's basically the chief execs and the commissioners. 
everybody has authority to commit on behalf of their organisation. We have risk share agreements. If we go over budget, you know, that's all apportioned uh, proportionately. And then there's an alliance management team. <coughs> so they, they actually do the stuff. Uh, and then there's an alliance manager who essentially runs the alliance um, and is accountable to the alliance leadership team. Uh, so I've kind of covered this, I think. Yeah. <coughs> Um, and some of our kind of experimental results, um, I, I've just picked a few out. So the Creative Solutions Forum, this is the practice forum that I talked about earlier, the two structures, this is the one in practice. So we first prototyped this in 2016, it's a permanent fixture now. This, is the, this was quite interesting. When we started this, uh, we asked how many people do you think would need this, and we got 95 names, and within three meetings we were struggling for referrals, and when we said, Where's the 95 people? The Mental Health Trust and Adult Social Care said we were so embarrassed going to those meetings that one of our internal departments had handed off another. We've changed all our internal processes and there are fewer cases coming forward. So what we've noticed with this forum is when we started there were lots and lots of mental health cases and now largely uh, they've been replaced by people with autistic spectrum disorders and those kind of things as things have changed. And it's about those cases where you get multiple handoffs. The kind of cases that, that Mark was talking about. Um, uh, it's a standing membership of, of uh, mental health, public health, uh, adult social care, about nine or ten people. We regularly have 30 to 40 services come to the meeting and sometimes they, they are literally standing, around, they stand around the edge of the room. And there's, I mean, it's an amazing kind of life-affirming thing because they, a lot of them are not commissioned by us. They have no, you know, they have no reason to be there other than they want to do something good for some for someone. So it's shared and owned by Adult Safeguarding because everything needs a strategic home, and that's the home of this. But any service can attend by invitation. Uh, so if we think they're relevant to a case, we would invite them. The main thing is it's a permissive, collegiate, and supportive. Uh, ethos. Um, the only rule is that you cannot come to hand off a case. You can't bring a case and say, I'm bringing this case because I'm evicting them on Friday. Um, we would not allow that to happen. So you, you, loads of people would make loads of lives. You can come and say that this person is dangerous and we need to move them somewhere else and we might relocate them, but we would not make them homeless. Um, we would not, because that creates just huge waste and cost in the system. So the purpose is a full case discussion, a bespoke, often quite creative um, uh, response to reduce risk. The biggest reason people are brought is perceived risk by the worker. Um, we want to eliminate any gaming that's going on or any handoffs. Because let's be honest, often our most vulnerable people, our most complex people, um, our really expensive services refuse to work with them. Uh, and so they end up in your direct access hostel, you know, people with an unstable emotional personality disorder. The mental health will say, can't work with those. Uh, and actually they, get, they end up in your, in your hostel. And actually they do quite well because what ho the only resource the hostel has is the relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and they work really, really hard on building relationships. It's kind of really strange, it kind of inverts the pyramid. So the first, the first 12 months, we had 52 cases, 27 women, 25 men. These are the people that referred, so anybody can refer, any agency, individual or person. These were the reasons they were referred. So you will recognize these kinds of people, because they will be using masses of unplanned care in your system. Um, Quite a lot of this is about uncertainty, so quite a lot of this is we don't know if this person has cause cost, we don't know if they've got capacity, we don't know why they're having a fit, we don't know, you know, quite a lot of it, it's to do with that. We do ask for diagnosis, although increasingly we ignore diagnosis. We just look at presenting behaviours, because so many of these diagnostic labels are designed to exclude you from services, that, that, that they've got no real utility uh, beyond that. So we just focus on what is the presentation, what do they want, uh, how, can we, how can we give it to them. So uh, all but five of the cases which uh, uh, 
uh, reported refugees. The, the five that were lost to follow up, um, I think three went to prison and two went to other areas. Um, the workers uh, report feeling more supported in managing risks and what we've found over the two or three years it's been running is they're much more prepared to take risks. Uh, huge reductions in the use of emergency services. One case uh, was averaging three ambulance or police calls a day uh, and has been living independently without any ambulances for 18 months. Massive reductions in bed and breakfast use. Uh, it made us develop an end of life pathway for street homeless people so they don't have to die in a doorway that we actually got a, a proper palliative care facility now in the hostel for those, for those f few, few people. Um, everybody achieved a housing option or plan that they were satisfied with. Um, loads of systems learning, loads of this was caused by our failure as a system to do something early. The other in interesting thing that's happened is people sit with their, so the mental health worker and the adult social care worker and the drug workers, that they have the computers open. So if there's a question about, well, what, what, does Mark have a diagnosis? Yeah, his diagnosis is this. Is he on a prescription? So in real time, people share, share information. It just seems so obvious, uh, but yeah. Another one is the alcohol assertive outreach team. So um, as you can see, there's a small number of people who cost an absolute fortune, um, four grand a pop uh, for 15 patients alone. Um, they have they, they're constantly using emergency. So these are admissions, this is hepatology, uh, but they're all, they also, of course, use uh, the emergency department. Uh, they're quite likely to block a bed, uh, uh, reinforcing kind of maladaptive process. Anyway, so we did a huge kind of round of a quite lengthy inquiry because they're, they're very, very complicated people. And what you find is that this. They're really, really lonely. They have no human contact out, outside the off-license. Uh, their alcohol use was extreme. They had really traumatic early histories. They had all had significant health problems caused by their drinking. Uh, they all had mental health problems of varying severity. Uh, and most of them had no positive daily structure at all. So this was the focus uh, uh, for the team, um, mental health, social care, it's being flexible, focusing on what the patient wanted. I'm using the language of patient because this came from the acute trust. Uh, the practitioners were really explicit about their role in this, uh, but the re ethos for the workers is about <laughs> going the extra mile or going out of your way, being really, really persistent in, in reaching out to people um, and providing extended, extended care up to, you know, up, up to a year long. Um, what they mainly do uh, is, is they mainly meet them for coffee uh, and send them texts and phone them you know, a couple of times a week and it literally takes a 10 minute phone call, meet you for a cup of coffee for half an hour, come and visit your house and gradually you build a relationship and you can, you can link the person into friends groups. Uh, if you're going to do dog walking for lonely people, risk assess the dogs. Um, <laughs> so there's lots of things you can the really low costs that make a huge difference. Um, so these are the huge differences. 44% reduction in admissions, 33% reduction in bed days. Saved us about 300k. Creative Deloitte Solution Forum, as you can see, almost everybody within three meetings is no longer in crisis. That they're, they're much more settled. They're much more into a kind of normal by default uh, service offer. It, it, for the whole alliance, so the whole alliance is it's seven services and three commissioners. It's a, it's a 7.7 .7 million pounds a year, 10 year contract. Before we let the contract, we had to remove three quarters of a million quid because of posterity. We have no, had no loss of service. In fact, the alliance treats more people nine months in than it did before with less money. Uh, in the first three months of the contract, 65 people had to be hostel collapsed. I mean, not literally, figuratively. Um, and we had to rehome 65 people. They were all they're all they're in houses and flats. They're not in another hostel. They're all rehomed by the alliance. Um, and also, an inpatient unit collapsed, and figuratively, not actually. And and they were all kind of uh, replaced in in alternatives to inpatient care. 
we ended the idea of stages in accommodation. We used to have this, I still don't really understand it, but there used to be this kind of stepped approach, pathway approach to housing. So stage one, stage two, stage, stage one, stage two. two. So, so we just do over that. And what we do is we say, Mark, what do you want? And he says, I'd like a flat, please. I say, OK, we'll give you a flat. Um, bed, and bed and breakfast. So last year, the council spent £1.1 million on bed and breakfast. This year, the projected spend on bed and breakfast is 600k. Because essentially, um, people go into bed and breakfast because they're evicted. And all the people that used to evict them are now in the alliance and they're financially responsible for the consequences. So there's, there are no, no longer any consequences, consequence-less evictions. We have common core assessment, common confidentiality. We have this program of workforce development with this knowledge and skills framework. And with multiple, multiple, co I mean, everybody seems to be working from everybody else's building um, just because it's convenient <coughs> and, and easy and no one, there's no kind of grand plan. People just kind of do it. And there you go. On time? Cool. Thank you. Thank you.